Since the birth of the Islamic Republic 30 years ago, Iran has been at daggers drawn with the West. In the last decade, as the West has put more troops on Iran's borders, the conflict has grown. In a luxury London hotel, a senior Iranian made a surprising offer to one of the West's principal negotiators with Iran. The Iranians wanted to be able to strike a deal whereby they stopped killing our forces in Iraq in return for them being allowed to carry on with their nuclear program. Iran had never before admitted responsibility for coalition deaths in Iraq. And when the senior Iranian said it, no other witnesses were present. This is the story of how the West struggles to handle its most intractable adversary. The Panjshir Valley, Afghanistan. What happened here in 2001 created a rare opportunity for Iran and the West to come together. Iran's enemies, the Taliban, controlled almost all of Afghanistan, except this valley, which was held by Iran's ally, the Northern Alliance. Its commander, Ahmad Shah Massoud, was the only Afghan the Taliban could not conquer. But now, they had him trapped. Two North Africans, with Belgian passports and a letter of introduction from an Islamic group in London, persuaded Massoud to give them an interview. They began with some unexpected questions. Why are you against Osama bin Laden? Why do you call him a killer? Each exploded a bomb, one in the camera and the other in a suicide belt. Massoud was dead. Shayad man avalin nafarat budam dar dunya ke az mawzu mutalim me shudam. Porsesh mohem in ke chera Ahmad Shah Massoud in gune terror shode va chera asan terror shode dar in maqta che ittefaq yoftade ke Iranian intelligence judged that only Al-Qaeda could have pulled off this complex hit. One obvious motive was to help their hosts, the Taliban. But it smelt of an international plot. فکر می کردیم که آنچه که اتفاق افتاده پایان یک ماجرا نیست، آغاز یک ماجرا است. Massoud's other ally also smelled a rat. Мы с президентом Бушем говорили, и я в разговоре с ним упомянул о том, что на днях был убит лидер Северного альянса в Афганистане Масуд. И я сказал тогда американскому коллеге. Знаешь, меня это очень тревожит. Такое чувство, что что-то должно произойти. Они явно к чему-то готовятся. The next day was the 11th of September, 2001. Я дам мёд, что в 4:00 بعد از ظهر به وقت ما بود. Мен بیرون بودم به دفترم که آمدم به من گفتن که تلویزیونا رو نگاه بکن ببین چه حادثه‌ای رخ داده. به منم نگفتن چی. ایشون اولین سوالشون بود که ارزاوی ما از مسئله چیست؟ گفتیم این کار توسط القاعده انجام شده اما اینکه چرا و چگونه سوالهای پرسشای زیادی هم هست که نمیتونیم جواب اونها رو طبعا بی‌زودی ها پیدا کنیم در اون لحظه گفتم ما باید موضع بگیریم یک موضع انسانی در مقابل این عمل دوم اظهار تاثیر از اینکه این همه انسان کشته شده 
For the 20 years since the Islamic Revolution, Iranians had chanted death to America. The authorities ordered that stopped. Instead, Iran mourned the victims of 9-11. President Mohammad Khatami led the most moderate government since Iran became an Islamic state. He had sought reconciliation with America, but his political opponents stopped him. With America poised to attack the Taliban, he had a chance to win the argument in the cabinet. The Taliban is a enemy. The Americans think the Taliban is an enemy. و سرنگونی طالبان در درجه اول تامین کننده منافع ایران بود. They decided to talk to the Americans. The only place where US and Iranian officials met was the UN. A member of Iran's delegation brought a message for the US government. He said that Iran was prepared to work um, unconditionally with the United States uh, in the war on terror that if they could work with us on this issue, it had the potential to fundamentally transform U.S.-Iranian relations. In 1979, Iran had taken American diplomats hostage. The USA and Iran had had no diplomatic relations since. Now, Iranian and U.S. diplomats started meeting secretly in a body called the 6 plus 2 group. These meetings took place in New York and also in Geneva. The Iranians were willing to do whatever was necessary to help to ensure that the U.S. military campaign could succeed. For almost a month, the U.S. bombed the Taliban and Al-Qaeda heartlands south and east of Kabul. در افغانستان به قول خود افغان ها چیزی نبود که خراب بشه قبلا همه چیزش خراب شده بود امریکایی ها حمله میکردن میگفتن حالا رفتن پناهگاهی رو پیدا کردن مثلا در غارها حمله میکردن یه بمب عجیب غریبی رو که میتونه یه کوه رو منهدم کنه شلیک میکردن هیچ اتفاق نمیفتاد This war could not be won from the air alone But Iran's allies, the Northern Alliance were still bottled up in the Panjshir Valley What they needed was the U.S. to bomb the Taliban where they were blocking the road to Kabul. Iran decided it was time to share crucial intelligence with America. They used the 6 plus 2 group. In one of these meetings, one of the Iranian leaders was a government leader, and he was able to do the inside of Afghanistan. He pounded the table and said, I've had enough of this. This is just, you know, this is just nice talk, but we're not going to get anywhere if we don't, if this bombing campaign doesn't succeed. نظرش این بود که امریکا اگر میخواد کاری بکنه باید با جبهه متحد یا با دوستان ایران هم کاری کنه. And then he took out a map and he unfurled the map on the table and started to point to targets that the U.S. needed to focus on, particularly in the north. We took the map to CENTCOM to the U.S. Central Command. And certainly that did become the U.S. military strategy. We took a fourth world force, the Northern Alliance, riding horses, walking, living off the land, and we married them up with a first world air force. And uh, it worked. The Northern Alliance took Kabul. Iran's strategy had succeeded. Next, Iran helped America create a new government for Afghanistan. But America still had Iran on its list of state sponsors of terror. The State Department proposed to open the way to dialogue. We couldn't get support from the NSC, from the Pentagon, from the Vice President's office. And in every case, we ran up against this belief in uh, regime change. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror, while an unelected few repress the Iranian people's hope for freedom. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil 
مسئله میور شرارت معین کردن ایران روابط ما رو به موقعیتی رساند که شاید بدتر از موقعیتی بود که در آغاز انقلاب و اوج دشمنی های ایران و آمریکا وجود داشت. Nine months later, the U.S. and Britain proposed a U.N. resolution that could authorize war against Iraq. The British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw toured the Middle East to seek support. Iran was a big cheese in the region, and it was important for me to see the Iranians, uh, to get them on board for what we were seeking to do with Saddam, which was to get rid of him. We cannot ignore the threat posed by Saddam Hussein to this region, to countries like Iran and Kuwait, to the Iraqi people themselves, and to the security of the region and the world. قبل از اون احساس دشمنی با صدام نگو صدام دشمن ما بود بنابراین ما هم میخواستیم که صدام از بین بریم صدام had invaded Iran 20 years earlier Iran had lost hundreds of thousands of young men President Hatami now made an unexpected offer Iran would provide America with intelligence and advice to help get rid of Saddam Hussein Bean an international arrangement in respect of Afghanistan in which they had participated and did no one much noticed this uh, but it had worked pretty well گفتم بیاین تجربه افغانستان رو در مورد عراق را تکرار بکنیم مونتا این دفعه شیش به علاوه شیش باشه شیش همسایه عراق به علاوه پنج عضو دائم شورای امنیت که آمریکا هم جزو اوناست به علاوه مصر آینده عراق هم برای ایران بسیار مهم بود در همین چارچوبی که ما به افغانستان نگاه می کردیم به آینده عراق هم نگاه می کردیم این روح زیادی در ایران بودن شخصیت های برجسته ای که میتونستن رهبران آینده عراق باشن آیا نمیشه به این ایران به عنوان نیرویی که می شود با اون مشکلات را حل کرد نگاه کنیم تا خود این را مشکل بدونیم I said you know this I, because I it wasn't directly in my gift uh, so I was cautious in response I could see the point he was making الله اکبر الله Straw knew that Iran and Iraq, both Shia majority states, are closely intertwined. No state was better placed to provide the UK and the US with intelligence in Iraq. But would President Bush accept help from one of his axis of evil? That was, of course, the $64,000 question. The crucial thing was to try it on uh, Colin Powell, I called him. But the State Department had a problem. The White House. Secretary Powell and I wanted to push the uh, possibility as far as the, uh, you know, as, as the traffic would bear, but we realized that there were some real practical limitations that the President was going to put on this. Colin was sympathetic, but he came back to me and said that he didn't think it was a runner. So as the American-led coalition crushed Saddam Hussein, Iran watched from the sidelines. Iran now faced American forces of a quarter of a million men on its Afghan border to the east and in Iraq to the west. And a president who believed in preemptive war. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. غروری که احساس میشد که ابرقدرت برتر دنیا هر کاری که میخواد میتونه انجام بده. The next day, an unprecedented proposal to mend Iran's shattered relationship with the West landed on a desk in the State Department. The Swiss ambassador who represented US interests in Iran 
had sent a fax. It starts out about with his meeting with Sadek Harzi. And I thought, hmm, this is a little bit different. Sadek Harazi, here on the right with President Hatami, was a key player in Iran. He was the foreign minister's nephew, an in-law of the supreme leader, and he'd been meeting the Swiss ambassador. The readout says that he's had these talks with Sadek Harazi, and Sadek Harazi has developed a roadmap for the normalization of US-Iranian relations. The roadmap suggested direct talks between Iran and America. Everything was on the table. Iran's wish list, America would refrain from supporting regime change and abolish all sanctions on Iran. And America's wish list, Iran would make Hezbollah into a peaceful political party and would accept the two-state Palestinian-Israeli peace process. That proposal had a number of elements which were of importance to Iran. That is, it had the element of mutual respect, which has been lacking in, in U.S. approach to Iran. The covering letter said that Harazi had two long discussions with the Supreme Leader and that President Hatami and his uncle, the Foreign Minister, were also present. All previous contact between the U.S. and Iran had been limited to single issues. Now it seemed the Supreme Leader had agreed with 85 to 90 percent of this ambitious paper. I read it. I think it's incredibly significant and groundbreaking. And I write the memo for Secretary Powell that would be from my boss at the time, Richard Haas. I thought the paper was, was interesting, uh, but I was skeptical. The biggest problem in dealing with Iran at that point was uncertainty about whether the government really spoke for the government uh, or whether the government really spoke for, you know, for the power centers uh, of, of the country. If the Iranians authorized it to be transmitted to the U.S. as the basis of talks, we should do it. I don't care whether they, they contracted it out to a great speechwriter. They authorized its transmission and we should call them on it. Washington said no. The decision wasn't made by hardline associates of the president, it was made at the top of the State Department. Even uh, in response to a proposal uh, that was basically a genuine attempt to resolve all issues of concern to either side, the United States simply decided to neglect it and put it aside. America's snub left diplomacy with Iran in European hands. Britain's foreign secretary flew to Tehran. President Hatami still needed to convince the West that the rest of Iran's leadership supported his moderate policies. I said to him that it didn't help that when they paraded their Shahab missiles on their National Military Day in Tehran, that the legend written on these missiles in English was death to the Americans. Hatami came straight back at me, uh, smiled and said, yeah, but that's some relief to me, because they used to write, death to heart of me. And it was a very poignant moment, really, uh, bringing out, uh, in a sense, his openness about the way in which he was continually being undermined by the conservative forces in Iran. Straw then said that the West was worried about Iran's investment in nuclear technology. <laughs> But Iran's military doesn't answer to the president alone. The supreme leader has the final say. Iran already had an ambitious program in ballistic missiles that could carry nuclear warheads. And Iran was building its first civil nuclear power station. Earlier in the year, inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, had confirmed the existence of this secret facility. Proof that Iran was also trying to master the secrets of enriching uranium, technology that could be used to make fuel or a bomb. Enrichment was the most difficult part of developing a nuclear weapon. It was maybe two-thirds, maybe three-quarters of the challenge. It wasn't actually producing the bomb, it was producing the highly enriched uranium that had to go into the bomb. And so, if the Iranians could master enrichment, they would be three-quarters of the way to producing a nuclear weapon. 
None of the leaders at that summer's G8 summit wanted Iran to become a nuclear power. But most were worried that the US might use force to stop them. The international community uh, uh, must come together to make it very clear to Iran that uh, we will not tolerate the construction of a nuclear weapon. Iran would be dangerous. Fundamentally, both the president and the vice president felt we were going to have to overthrow the regime. Iran, under the control of the Islamic Revolution, uh, was never going to be a rational partner, and that the ultimate way to stop uh, Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons or supporting international terrorism was to change the regime in Tehran. The Bush administration didn't openly threaten to strike Iran, but they did have an agreed phrase for it. All options are obviously on the table, as the president has said repeatedly. Senator, I just have to repeat, the president never takes any option off the table, and he shouldn't. Be very clear, the president of the United States doesn't take any options off the table. For our part, the United States is keeping all options on the table. And as the president has said, all options are on the table. Die Erfahrung äh, mit dem Krieg äh, im Irak und äh, die Sorge war groß, dass nach dem Irak sozusagen der Iran die nächste Stufe sein würde. Joska called me and said, look, we mustn't allow the Western allies to be split again in respect of Iran. Es gab zwei, zwei Dinge. Erstens, mein Eindruck war, Jack Straw wollte auf jeden Fall einen zweiten Irak vermeiden. Und zweitens, um die Amerikaner mit ins Boot zu holen, war Großbritannien unverzichtbar. He said, why don't you and I get a deal from the Iranians where in return for lifting of sanctions, we get copper-bottomed guarantees internationally verified that they're not pursuing a nuclear weapons program. Um, and I said, I thought it was a, a very good idea. Uh, obviously, I talked to the Prime Minister about it and he endorsed it. And so that's how the E3 process began. The E3, or EU3, the foreign ministers of the UK, France and Germany, had set themselves a difficult task. We went to Tehran to get them to agree to stop enrichment and everything to do with enrichment. They should stop it forever. So we wanted to get them into that by getting them to agree to a suspension, to a halt. My working assumption was that they would not have agreed to the meeting unless they had something to give us. Why would they? Dr. Hassan Rouhani, who led the Iranian delegation, was the national security advisor to the supreme leader. When the meeting began, he played his strongest card. Iran's right to enrich uranium under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. باید به همه حقوق قانونی خودش در زمینه سلحامیز و فعالیت های هستی سلحامیز برسه. The Europeans replied that Iran had violated its treaty obligations and should suspend its enrichment program. Iran had smuggled centrifuges to enrich uranium and then hid them from international inspectors. We are talking about a lack of trust and you are responsible for that. Rouhani said that they would agree to not putting radioactive material into the centrifuges. Which would mean that Iran was not enriching, and so that would mean suspension of enrichment. For us, it was a definition of the activities related to the enrichment, because it was all that we were trying to suspend. And we saw that there was a problem. The problem with Iran's definition of suspension was that it would allow them to build more centrifuges and master the skills needed to run them. We didn't want to allow a situation where all this equipment was kind of primed, ready to go, uh, but all they agreed to do was not to press the button. So that was the argument, and it was a really big argument. For two hours, the Iranians stood firm. Then Rouhani gambled that the Europeans would not want to go home empty-handed and would settle for Iran's narrow definition of suspension. Rouhani looked at his watch and said, oh, it's time for us to go and report to the president. And then something 
extraordinary happened, quite unscripted. And Yoshiko just banged the table and said, look, there's no point us going to see the president or talking to the press. We've not agreed anything. We would be fools. I mean, to sit there in a press conference, be polite, and uh, nobody had an interest, I mean, uh, to create bad feelings with our host. And Rouhani said, well, this is as much as we can agree to. And Yoshik said, well, in that case, we might as well go and catch our planes. You could see these guys thinking, God, that wasn't in our script. There was almost a total failure and breakout. Uh, we decided, both sides, I think, decided to, to call a break and, and uh, discuss it. The Iranian negotiator needed instructions from the supreme leader and the president. And Rouhani got out his mobile. اونها میگفتن که کلیه فعالیت هایی که به نه مرتبط هست به این مسئله با تعلیق باشه ما اینو قبول نداشتیم خب مسئله مشکل شد he was speaking very quietly but it was clearly quite an intense conversation that rahani was having it was quite extraordinary so we were sort of hanging around rahani's consultations with president hatami lasted over an hour they knew that if the europeans went home now President Bush might act. We said, "Well, now that you have come to an agreement, we will agree to it in the form of a statement." When Iran agreed that the International Atomic Energy Agency could set the terms of suspension, it seemed that they had caved in to Europe's demand. Now the Europeans were happy to meet the president. We were not bad in poker game too, in the diplomatic poker game. I mean, uh, the European part. But the Iranians thought they had the ace up their sleeve. They had already asked the IAEA director, Mohammed El Baradai, how he would define suspension. Dr. El Baradai had visited the day before, and they discussed the meaning of suspension. Dr. Rouhani believed that El Baradai. Uh, had considered suspension to be basically not feeding uh, uranium into the uh, centrifuges. متاسفانه آقای البرادعی علاوه بر قولی که یعنی علاوه بر حرفی که زده بود و علاوه بر معیارهایی که بود یک جور دیگری تعلیق رو مطرح کردن که به نظر ما امر بسیار خلاف اخلاقی بود. The IAEA defined suspension as Europe wanted. And four months later, they reported that Iran had been hiding a new, advanced centrifuge. Iran had expected agreement with Europe would bring economic rewards. None came. Later that year, Iran went to the polls to elect a new parliament. The clerics and the supreme leader disqualified most of the candidates who favored negotiations with the West. The new parliament was dominated by hardliners. This tough line was reinforced by the Supreme Leader's new appointment to the National Security Council, Ali Larajani. Bardosh ye de, مثل ماهای بود که این در واقع نوید یه قالیچه ای داره میده که ما روش پیشیم که هیچ وقت قصد بافتنش وجود نداره و فقط از رنگارنگی این قالیچه و خوش رنگ و آب بودنش داره بر ما توصیف میکنن. Iran's negotiators needed to show they could win concrete rewards. So one of them approached the IAEA director to help get trade concessions from Europe to impress the voters. Iran's next round of elections was imminent. A lot of candidates for the election will benefit from us losing, losing. this, yeah, I know this that. negotiation. I know that. I know that. They, yeah. they, will not, they will not see
Die Iraner waren unter innenpolitischem Druck, wir wiederum waren unter äh, Abstimmungsdruck mit den USA. Es war nicht einfach, hier schnell voranzugehen. Wir konnten nichts anbieten, was am Ende äh, keinen Bestand haben würde. At the 2004 UN General Assembly, Jack Straw set up a meeting with Iran's foreign minister, Kamal Kharazi, to see if there was any way forward. But Straw was late for the meeting. There was a crisis. A British civilian, Ken Bigley, had been taken hostage in Iraq. Uh, Jack is uh, he's having to phone the family uh, of the hostage we have in, uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's obviously extremely difficult for us. It's a, it's a, it's a huge yeah, issue. Yeah, the same problem. Two years earlier, the West had spurned Iran's offer of help to deal with Iraq. Now, Kharazi couldn't resist pointing out how much that refusal was costing. It's, um, it's obviously... It, it's Very dangerous environment. It is yeah, a dangerous environment. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. dangerous it was more safe when Saddam Hussein was in for whom was it more safe? <laughs> <laughs> Minister, was it more safe for the hundreds of thousands of people? No, even for British uh, citizens. Iraqis weren't safe under <laughs> Saddam Hussein. Yes. Iranians weren't safe under <laughs> Saddam Hussein. How many Iranians were killed by Saddam Hussein? Many. Yeah. And they were killed by arms supplied by European countries, American and uh, so how are you? I'm okay. Difficult times. How are you? A few minutes later, Straw showed up and broke the tension. But the two sides were no closer to breaking the impasse over Iran's nuclear enrichment. The Iranians wanted trade embargoes lifted. Europe couldn't deliver. Long-standing American sanctions punished anyone who traded with Iran. Jack Straw decided to ask Colin Powell to let Europe offer some incentives, some carrots, to Iran. He raised it at the annual dinner of G8 foreign ministers. I had a very close relationship with Colin Powell. I talked to him and said, we've got to give something to them and let us see. It's in our interest to try and give something to the Khatami regime. On a senti qu'il acceptait en fait le principe des carottes et que peut-être on pourrait espérer du côté américain un geste. On savait, on avait dit aux Américains, vous savez, un geste, c'est sans doute les avions. Et donc seuls les Américains pouvaient faire ça. And Colin Powell agreed and said, well, he thought it would be very useful for the political directors to meet, and he invited us all to Washington a couple of weeks later to do that. Euh, nous sommes sortis de ce dîner dans un grand état de, de satisfaction. The Europeans now worked out the detail of exactly what could be offered to Iran. Three weeks later, they brought their proposal to Washington. Nous pensions que peut-être qu'une décision très importante allait être prise du côté américain. Nous savions que ça allait être difficile. Nous entendions les bruits les plus divers. The administration's most outspoken hardliner had been lobbying against the new policy. I was stunned that Powell had deviated from our policy by saying, let's offer the Iranians even more carrots than the EU3 had been offering. But the Europeans were met by Powell's loyal deputy, Richard Armitage. The reason I even met with them was because they had to realize that there were some sensible people on the seventh floor. Et puis, et puis Armitage est parti. Et la délégation américaine a été présidée, à partir de ce moment-là, par John Bolton. You could see the evident dissatisfaction on John Sawyer's face uh, because I was still there. And I leant over and said, uh, uh, let me know if I can help in terms of, you know, achieving a, a common 
uh, outcome to this. And I just got a sort of frosty glare. In the face of Bolton's hostility, Soares presented the new plan on behalf of the Europeans. Our proposal included spare parts for their aircraft, possible sale of new aircraft, um, the capacity for international um, nuclear companies to cooperate with the Iranians on civil nuclear power. Bolton nous a écouté avec un visage euh, qui ne bougeait pas. Bolton said, right, has everybody else spoken? Okay. And he got out a sheet of paper and said, this is the U.S. position. We expected uh, Iran to suspend all of its uranium enrichment activities and come into full compliance with its safeguards obligations. And not until that happened uh, would we consider any, uh, anything. Le voilà en train de lire comme un fonctionnaire soviétique un texte, un papier. Euh, que c'était un papier de fermeture totale. Why had we travelled across the Atlantic and wasted two days of our time to go to Washington just to be um, uh, go to a meeting which was undermined by the hosts and the people who uh, uh, who were organising it? Well, uh, a lot of parts of U.S. policy making doesn't make sense from the outside, but John Bolton was placed in the department by the Vice President of the United States, who had great faith in his ability. Unfortunately, when he's not on your side uh, and it's very difficult to fire him, uh, you couldn't have a worse enemy. Soon afterwards, Secretary of State Colin Powell and his deputy Richard Armitage announced their resignations. The next talks between the EU3 and Iran were scheduled in Paris. Neither side had much to offer, but neither was willing to accept failure. So the Iranians agreed to a complete suspension for three months, while the Europeans would try to find ways to increase trade. We put it in the Paris Agreement that suspension is essential as long as negotiations proceed. And we use the word, we use the word proceed to show that it's not simply the negotiations should, should go on, but in fact they should move forward. The deal was signed. I was on a busy commuter train to uh, Oxfordshire on the Friday, uh, looking forward to a bit of a rest because it had been a very busy period. And I get this call on the train and it's Karazi who wants to talk to me. The Iranian foreign minister wanted to discuss the agreement just reached in Paris. There's no way I could take the call, as it were, with the audience of some scores of commuters. So I say, hang on, and I go to the lavatory and then find out what he wants. Uh, and what he wanted uh, was essentially to amend this deal. The Iranians had just signed the agreement to turn off and seal every single centrifuge they owned. Now their foreign minister asked for an exemption, for research. He said, well, you know, we did say none, but actually we mean 20. I said I have to call him back because by this stage, uh, trying to negotiate on something as important as this from a train lavatory and with the computers, wanting, I think somebody was actually at the door wanting to make use of the loo for its proper purpose. Jack phoned me to tell me uh, what uh, Harazi had said to him. Uh, and I said, I thought that sounded extremely dangerous. Uh, I got together uh, a couple of elderly gents who'd been involved back in the time when we were developing enrichment back in the 1950s and 60s. They said, oh, I remember how we did this. We had 16 centrifuges that we ran continuously for two years. And after two years of running 16 centrifuges, we'd mastered enrichment. So if the Iranians want to keep 20 centrifuges, they probably want to do the same thing. All right, thank you. Bye. Great. Great. No, he, he says Mr. Straw, Secretary Straw may be interested. And may, may, may In the end, Straw phoned Foreign Minister Harazi. I said, look, the deal's a deal. You know, you guys are really difficult, come impossible to negotiate with. When you sign a deal, you know, it is a deal. Iran dropped the request to keep 20 centrifuges, finally implementing the full suspension the West had been asking for. IAEA cameras monitored it. But the relationship between Iran and the West was about to take a new turn. President Khatami's term in office was up. A member of Nobel 
یک بدبینی شدیدی در ایران وجود داره و اون این که میگه آمریکا میخواد ما رو به کلی از این حق محروم کنه اروپا هم دارد در مسیر آمریکا حرکت میکنه و هر چی شما تحلل بکنیم و به نتیجه این آی نرسیم این بدبینی توسعه پیدا میکنه Iran's voters elected a new president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the pop star of Iranian politics. And America had a new Secretary of State. As National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice had not concentrated on Iran. Now she put it at the top of her agenda. I met Secretary Rice at the airport and we had a long talk on the ride into Brussels. She said that Iran was beginning to increase its assistance both to Shia militants in Iraq, uh, to the Hezbollah, to the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So Iran had become the largest funder and supplier of arms to most of the Middle East groups that were shooting at us or shooting at the Israelis or the moderate Palestinians. And secondly, Iran was continuing its nuclear research. Rice made Burns her deputy and asked him to take on the Iran brief. She wanted to know if the State Department was up to the job. I went back to Condi and reported that, Condi, we have half a person in the entire Department of State devoted to one of the most significant countries in the world, and she was appalled. Back here! Within days, Rice would receive a report from Iraq that would strengthen her resolve to deal with Iran. She had sent a trusted colleague to Iraq to find out what was going wrong. Shia militias backed by Iran were emerging as the biggest threat to Western success in Iraq. Rice's advisor was briefed by US and UK intelligence that in the Shia South, more and more coalition soldiers were being killed by a new type of roadside mine. It could penetrate even armored vehicles. It's rare to get a convergence of intelligence from so many different kinds of sources and from so, uh, several different agencies that all end up pointing in the same direction. American and British intelligence concluded that these mines were factory made in Iran. The people who are being killed by these devices were our soldiers in the field and they were the people who literally had gone to the sites of these explosions and cleaned up the bodies and body parts of their comrades. From their point of view, one more soldier getting killed is huge. Secretary Rice's counselor reported back, Iraq remains a failed state and an open field for violent Iranian subversion. But by now, President Bush wasn't ready to strike at the sponsors of terrorism. Instead, he had the State Department send a secret warning to Iran. The continuation of this Iranian behavior would be regarded by us as enemy action. America's warning was delivered in the autumn of 2005. Iran's response came via Europe. There are various Iranians who would you know, come to London and suggest we had tea in, the, uh, 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 in some hotel or other. So they do the same in Paris, they do the same in Berlin, and then we compare notes among the three of us. The Iranians' tea time initiative was breathtakingly bold. The Iranians wanted to be able to strike a deal whereby they stopped killing our forces in Iraq in return for them being allowed to carry on with their nuclear program. We stop killing you in Iraq, uh, stop undermining the political process there, you allow us to carry on with our nuclear program without let or hindrance. You said we can make life easier for you in Iraq if you give Iran's nuclear program a pass. What sort of deal were you offering? Uh, as, as you remember, many members of, of, the, of that meeting went public and denied that that statement had ever been made. I but you're not you denying to... it, are you? 
Uh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is that Iran can and has played an active role and supportive role both in Afghanistan and Iraq. And You're saying Iraq, here and we it can could play a more active role. You're saying it's realpolitic. Um, it's uh, and uh, from the Iranians' point of view, um, they wanted freedom on the nuclear dossier. The West ignored the offer of a deal, but Iran had made it clear. If it were attacked, its allies in Iraq would kill more Americans, British and Iraqis there. President Ahmadinejad announced that Iran would restart its nuclear enrichment plant. بدانید ملت ایران از حق مسلم خود صرف نظر نخواهد کرد بشنوید این صدای ملت ایران است که نظر خود را به سراحت نسبت به انرژی هستهی اعلام می کند بشنوید A few weeks later, Jack Straw played host to Condoleezza Rice in his constituency. The confrontation with Iran was pulling the US and the UK apart. For the first time since the invasion of Iraq, the UK was refusing to endorse American threats. I was saying, hang on, you know, you just need to understand that there aren't any circumstances in which this British government, or in my view, any British government, uh, could be involved in military action against Iran. Uh, Secretary of State, what next steps could be taken to persuade the Iranians to pull back from the uranium enrichment program? Jack Straw keeps telling us that military action will never be used. First of all, um the American president never takes any option off the table. You don't want the American president to take uh, any option off the table to respond. To My point uh, from a British perspective was that since I thought that it uh, would be completely inappropriate uh, and counterproductive to take military action. And given at the background of, of Iraq, I mean, I think we would have been involved in a political fast storm if I had given a hint that military action was a possibility. Now, I may say Tony Blair took a different view about that. Within the month, Blair would remove Jack Straw from the Foreign Office. But he still had one last chance to exploit the special relationship. At the end of the, of the trip, Connie and I went to her plane. Straw stayed on board. He flew with Rice on an unscheduled trip to Iraq. On that trip, we spent quite a long time in her cabin talking about Iran. My uh, message to Condi was uh, this. We Europeans have gone as far as we can by ourselves, and frankly, so far as the Iranians are concerned, we Europeans are a sprat to catch a mackerel, and you're the big fish, the United States. After changing planes in Kuwait, they arrived in the war zone. In the previous month, a thousand Iraqis and 31 Americans had died there. Sunnis and Shias were killing each other across the length and breadth of the country. The government of Iraq couldn't come together around a new prime minister, in part because Iran was deeply involved. We wanted to counter the Iranian pressure. All this was going on at the same time that journalists in the United States were writing that we were getting ready for war with Iran. It was clear to me that she was anxious to find a way through this, and that she would, if she could, seek to uh, get uh, other principals and the president on board uh, for direct involvement uh, in talks with the Iranians. Rice was about to attempt her most audacious move as Secretary of State. It was the Easter holidays. George and Laura Bush hosted an Easter egg hunt at the White House. But Condi Rice stayed home. <laughs> 
she asked her staff to give her a series of calendars uh, for April and May and June and July. And she began to sketch out a diplomatic strategy that would get us to negotiations with the Iranians. She took that and had breakfast the next morning with President Bush and received the president's permission to go ahead. The Secretary of State would make an announcement later that day. Iran's negotiator was given the text. We are agreed with our European partners on the essential elements of a package containing both benefits if Iran makes the right choice and costs if it does not. As soon as Iran fully and verifiably suspends its enrichment and reprocessing activities, the United States will come to the table with our EU colleagues and meet with Iran's representatives. For the first time in almost three decades, the U.S. was offering to speak directly with Iran. Regime change was out. That policy had failed. We had tried, we had, we had um, advocated regime change. We had a very threatening posture towards Iran for a number of years. It didn't produce any movement whatsoever. The Americans made it possible to offer the Iranians more than any of them had thought conceivable from civil nuclear power stations to the biggest prize of all, welcoming the Islamic Republic into the family of nations. Secretary Rice and I were quite buoyant. We felt that the Iranians were going to accept this offer. The offer was presented to Iran's negotiator by the EU's foreign policy chief. I tried to be as constructive as possible as friendly as possible to him, as respectful as possible to his country. They went into a side room with a translator. I went into some of the details that uh, we prefer not to be sat in the, in the formal meeting. Centrifuges for research were what Jack Straw had turned down two years earlier. This was a big concession to Iran. He said, whatever proposal you make to me here, I will have to, to discuss it with the other people in the, in the structure of power of, 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 of Tehran. And as you know, the structure of power of Tehran is not a simple matter. President Ahmadinejad was against the proposal. Larajani was in favor. But when he came to Brussels six weeks later, all he could do was turn on the charm. Yes was not there, no was not there. Yes but, and no but, it was full of that. And uh, in Farsi it's much easier to do that. In English it's more difficult. You let us know, so that's A month later they met again. There now seemed to be enough support in the National Security Council for Larajani to take a half step forward. Larajani and Solana hatched a plan to open talks in New York during the UN General Assembly. The New York meeting was to be carefully choreographed. Iran would temporarily suspend enrichment and the West would suspend sanctions. <laughs> 
The key was that the two sides would make these concessions at the same time. Lara Jani would come to New York, to the Waldorf Astoria. He would meet with the European foreign ministers and the Russians and Chinese foreign ministers. He would accept the basis of negotiations. And at that point, Secretary Rice could then enter the room, have dinner with them, sit down across from them, and have the very first conversation. To diplomacy, Dr. Arjani was very enthusiastic about that meeting with the permanent members of the Security Council. And to do that in New York at the time of the General Assembly was not a minor thing. New York would give Larajani the chance to win the argument in Iran. He'd get rid of hated sanctions. Receiving the public respect of world leaders would show that Iran was no longer a pariah state. The Americans were ready. We had formed a negotiating team. We'd done all sorts of research on how best to work with them. We'd thought through the various elements of what we would do and the pace of the negotiations. We were quite looking forward to it. We're working toward a diplomatic solution to this crisis. And as we do, we look to the day when you can live in freedom and America and Iran can be good friends and close partners in the cause of peace. The Iranians were due at the UN on Monday. The Friday before, the State Department got a message. Larajani would have minders. The Iranians sent word to us that they had to have a delegation of nearly 300 people accompany Larajani. None of them had visas. And Condi said to me, let's take away any excuse they have not to come. So I called our embassy in Bern in Switzerland and I said, could you please stay open throughout the entire weekend, issue several hundred visas, which they did. All the technical questions we have resolved. The visa were there, the travel arrangements were done. I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Mr. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. The Iranian who arrived in New York and who was the center of attention at the United Nations was not the nuclear negotiator. The president will have a press conference on Thursday. It seems President Ahmadinejad had won the argument in Iran. Once uh, President Ahmadinejad uh, showed up in New York, uh, it was clear that uh, two were too many. The plane never took off. Larajani never took off from Tehran. He never made the trip. Those 300 people didn't get on the airplane. They never showed up in New York. And we were in New York thinking, well, maybe he'll come tomorrow or the next day or next week. Larajani was replaced by a much more hard-line negotiator. And Iran went ahead with its nuclear program. The West imposed more sanctions. 30 years ago, Iran's revolution promised freedom from Western interference. But the Islamic Republic ended up also rejecting liberalism and secularism, the principles that govern Western society. The many dead on both sides have reinforced this bitter divide. It will be difficult for any new leader to shift the weight of history. We will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist.